with an insult. The bread that Jesus gives is for the children of Israel, not for Gentile dogs. Not only does this seem like a reversal of the openness that we heard from him last week, this is not what we expect from Jesus. Commentators have spilled a lot of ink trying to explain this away. They emphasize Jesus' humanity. Well, you know, he was tired. He was trying to get away. He was perhaps not at his best when she approached him. Or they emphasize Jesus' divinity. He was testing her. Well, that's fine. But, and God does test us. But does he play with people who are coming, praying to him? Said calling them dogs to see if they'll respond correctly? That, you don't really expect this sort of thing from Jesus. But whatever it is that Jesus was trying to teach, this woman learned. She does not reject what Jesus has said. She doesn't go off in a huff. She accepts the metaphor and uses it in faith to persevere in her prayer. Yes, Lord, that's right. The children get fed first. Jesus is, after all, the Messiah of the God of Israel. He has come to bring back the lost sheep of Israel. He has come to be Israel to Israel. To return them to their Lord. But even after the children have eaten, there are still some leftovers for the dogs under the table. Part of Israel's commission, part of the Messiah's royal vocation, is to be a light to the nations. As St. Paul says in Romans, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The bread that Jesus provides for thousands has leftovers. He directs his disciples to collect the fragments left over. There is still food for others even after the first seating has been satisfied. And Jesus accepts this testimony of her faith. She understands his mission. For saying this, you may go. Your daughter has already been healed. He heals her at a distance, and before he has even spoken a word, it's done. What a contrast to the other healing we hear of this morning in the second part of this little mini break in Gentile territory. Jesus has now gone down through and he's in the Decapolis, the Gentile cities up to the northeast of the Sea of Galilee, where he encounters someone who could not hear of him as a Syrophoenician woman had, and cannot ask for his help. A man who is deaf and has an impediment such that he cannot speak. But his friends bring him to Jesus and beseech Jesus to restore. Part of the Messiah's vocation is to heal the bodies of those he has come to save. Does that always happen? It does not always happen. This is a what we hear from Isaiah this morning is a word of what happens in God's future, of when the new creation is complete, the eyes of the blind open, the ears of the deaf unstop, the lame leaping like deer, tongues loosed to praise our Lord. The healings that Jesus does in his earthly ministry are signs of that great healing which begins for all of us in his cross and resurrection and our baptism into that. 
and sometimes manifests itself in physical healing in this life, but sometimes not, and the final diagnosis for every single one of us is, he's dead. Because resurrection is raising the dead. And that is what Jesus finally came to do. But in the interim, when asked, he has been known to heal from time to time. And that is what happens here in the Decapolis. And what an earthy healing it is. Sticking his fingers in the man's ears. Jesus' saliva on the man's tongue. Jesus sighing to heaven. A better translation might be groaning to heaven. And saying the Aramaic word, Ephatha. Be open his ears are open so he can hear the word and his tongue is loosed so that he can proclaim what God has done for him and praise his Lord. Grace is everywhere. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus' royal vocation as the Messiah is to be Israel to Israel, to bring Israel back to her Lord, but also to shed the light of this God throughout the whole world. Grace is for everyone. We hear in Romans 2 and Acts 10 that God shows no partiality. And James tells us today that if we believe in him, we need to be careful not to show partiality ourselves. If God's grace is everywhere, and everyone who responds to that word of grace in faith receives the children's bread, then we need to know that it is not for us to withhold the bread of His grace, His mercy, from anyone. We are all hard of hearing when it comes to the word of grace. We are all slow to speak when it comes from saying a word of mercy or even a word of praise. But this is how our faith is lived out. Augsburg Confession, Article 5, says that saving faith comes from the Word and the sacraments, from hearing the Word, from the grace received at baptism, from coming to the table for the children's bread. And that that faith is lived out, Augustana the Confession of Augsburg, Number 6, in a new obedience. That's what St. James means by that very un-Lutheran question, can faith save you? Faith that's kept in a compartment, just like those Pharisaic rules that we heard about last week, can save no one because it's all boxed in on itself. Faith that is living and active, faith that makes us conduit of grace, simply manifests itself in our lives. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives to bear fruit. The Word comes into our ears to bear fruit in our lives. In the persevering prayer of a mother for her daughter, in the community of faith that brings someone who cannot hear the Word or ask for help to Jesus, All who receive this word and treasure it in honest hearts and live it, eat the children's bread. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.